Hello, Craig. Hello, Craig. Craig. Hi, Craig. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Paddock. We are the Paddock Girls. And on today's episode, we have me, Chelsea. We have Ido, Casey. We have Drea, Hannah. And of course, we have Leanne. Today, we're going to be starting a different kind of episode. We're going to be doing spotlight episodes. For our first spotlight, we're going to be starting off with a team that we love, Williams. You guys know we have our American driver, Logan, on it, and we have one of our besties, Alex. So we're going to be diving in on just Williams today. We're going to talk about the history, the origins, and we'll maybe sprinkle a little information at the end, but we're really excited to get into it. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Ida. Thanks, Chelsea. So yeah, Williams. Their official name is actually Williams Grand Prix Engineering, but in Formula One, they're known as Williams Racing. They were founded in... 1977 by Frank Williams, who actually had a prior Formula One team that he was trying to get off the ground called Frank William Racing Cars that competed from 1969 to 1976. After that, it was changed to Wolf Williams. And so Williams actually entered their first competition, the Spanish GP, in 19. 19- 77 using not their own chassis but mark chassis chassis being basically the body of the car like what you see and then in 78 they actually started producing their own cars their own chassis and everything but partnering with different engine suppliers fun fact also frank williams May he rest in peace, was actually knighted in 1999 for his service to the motorsports industry. Thank you for that, Ido. And so we're just going to dive into some of the racing history. For most that may not know, we wanted to go through some racing history starting back from the beginning at 1979, kind of working our way up to the beginning, talk about some highs and lows that they had, and give you some insight of who Williams is. While they had a rather rough start to their first season, scoring zero points, the 1978 season definitely looked more promising. Then, after signing the Australian driver, Alan Jones, they managed their first points in South Africa at only the third race of the season. Jones' first podium came at Watkins Glen in central New York later that same year. Those two results, as well as other good finishes, led Williams to finish ninth in the Constructors that year. And honestly, 1979 was even better for them. Thanks to the recruitment of Frank Journey, who was put in charge of the aerodynamics and skirt design. So the aerodynamics, simply put, it's a being of air that moves around the car and how that movement can be used to make a car faster, or it can hinder its speed, just depending on the design. So related to kind of the F1 skirts of that era, uh, they were mainly used in the original ground effect era, which was the 70s and 80s. I mean, nowadays you'll hear ground effect terms thrown around a lot for the current Formula One seasons, kind of since about 2022, because that's when the regulations came back into play. Only this time, instead of the skirts uh, of the 70s and 80s, which made the gap between the track and the sides of the car, there was a seal that was formed prevented air kind of from leaking out underneath the side pods and making it very streamlined, which increased the downforce and helped to reduce drag. Those skirts are not in the modern ground effect era, but the underbody tunnels of the era are currently in the 2022 and onward season. When you see the bottom of the cars flipped over, you can kind of see how instead of just being completely flat, you'll see little tunnels kind of on the bottom of the cars. But the ground effect kind of Skirts and tunnels were banned in 1983 for safety reasons because a lot of high-speed accidents were caused kind of by the rapid downforce loss when that seal was broken going over a curb or something like that. A little, little technical uh, stuff there. Yeah, I know that might have been a little too technical, but don't worry. We'll go into further depth um, in future episodes and then maybe on our socials in the future. So stay tuned for that. Another reason why... 79 was special is that it was our first year that Williams was able to participate as a constructor in the championship, which as the Formula One Constructors Association at the time preferred led them to adding a second car and therefore adding a second driver to their roster for future. 
Yeah, so the second driver was a Swiss driver, and it was Clay, excuse me if I say this wrong, you guys can correct me later, Regazzoni, I believe. So he scored Williams their first point that season in Monaco by finishing second. Their first ever win came that same season at the British Grand Prix, in front of their home crowd, where Regazzoni finished 25 seconds in front of Reen Arnold. Now, the next round in Germany saw their first 1-2 finish as a team with Jones finishing two seconds ahead of Regazzoni, which, if I was a driver, that would just piss me off. After Germany, they continued their winning streak to cap off a great season, and they ended up finishing second in the championship behind my personal favorite, the Ferrari. And 1980 actually saw the departure of Regazzoni. He was replaced by the Argentinian Carlos Ruppmann. Overall, they had their best season yet, with Jones winning his first Drivers' Championship ahead of Nelson Piquet, and them also winning their first Constructors' Championship, scoring almost twice as many points as the second-place finisher, Liger. 81, though, once again, saw Williams dominating, winning four out of the 15 races, and once again, bagging the Constructors' Trophy. 1982 sadly saw the retirement of Jones, who was replaced by the Finnish Kiki Rosberg, who went on to win the Drivers' Championship, even though he only won one race. So for reference, that has only happened twice since the inception of Formula One in 1950. Fun fact, though, so keep that in your pocket. The 82 season as a whole was a weird one for Williams, as Rootman ended up quitting after only two races and being replaced by Mario Andretti. Yes, that Andretti from the U.S. Andretti only driving at the U.S. Grand Prix West in Long Beach, California, before being also replaced by Jared Daly. With the amount of musical chairs, um, it doesn't come as a surprise that they finished fourth in the constructor standing, even though Roseburg won as a driver. 83 saw Williams change over to Honda engines from the previous Ford engines for the last race of the season in South Africa. However, not even Rosberg's impressive win at Monaco or his fifth place finish in South Africa with that new engine could see them finish higher than fourth in the Constructors' Championship. The 1984 season once again saw a driver lineup change with Jacques Lafitte joining the team. Sadly, that didn't help them recapture the glory days that were the 1980s to 1982 season. While... 1985 wasn't that impressive in terms of results either. It was the first year that they designed a car that used carbon fiber technology, which was introduced by McLaren in 1981 and is used to this day due to its lightweight yet strong nature, which is perfect for Formula One cars that need to be light in order to be fast. In terms of drivers, Lafitte was replaced by British Nigel Mansell, who partnered Rosberg for that season, before the Finn would ultimately move to McLaren at the end of the season, but not before setting a new F1 lap record at the British Grand Prix. Even though 86 was a rough year for Frank Williams and therefore Williams Racing, as an accident left him paralyzed and therefore unable to be at any Grand Prix that season, they managed to win the Constructors' Championship and came close to winning the driver one as well with Mansell and the Brazilian Nelson Piquet. The cause of them not winning being Mansell's tire blowing at the last race of the season in an ill-timed pit stop by Piquet, which ultimately led to Alan Prost winning the driver's championship. 1987, though, saw Piquet win the title with Mansell coming in second, which of course meant that they handily won the Constructors' Championship once again. Surprisingly for 1988, although winning with a Honda engine in 87, they decided to switch suppliers to Judd as they weren't able to get a new contract with Honda. This led them with a markedly slower car as everyone else has started using turbo engines compared to their naturally aspirated ones. Having a new driver in Ricardo Patrice also didn't help matters, hence they didn't win a single race that season, though Mansell did manage to finish second twice. In 1989, Mansell was replaced by the Belgian driver, Tyree Botson, as well as the engines now being Renault. The new engine supplier 
definitely brought improved results as they ended up finishing second behind the McLaren in the Constructors' Championship due to Botson's win in Australia at the end of the season. Fun fact, this also meant that Williams won the first and last race of the 1980s. Skipping over 1990 as not much happened except for them finishing lower than the previous year, even though they retained the same drivers, engine, etc. 1991 saw the return of Mansell, and Damon Hill joined the team as a reserve driver. Mansell's return saw them finishing second in the Constructors' Championship, even though they had a few hiccups such as not finishing the USGP or a botched pit stop in Portugal. Another reason for Mansell's return to Williams was the great technical advances that they made kind of in the early 90s. This is when they introduced uh, the active suspension to the car. Uh, It's kind of an onboard electronic uh, suspension system that controls the wheel height in relation to the chassis instead of the traditional springs, mechanical springs. This was first added to the car in 1992. And around the same time is when the technical director of Williams, Patrick Head, hired a name we're all familiar with, Adrian Newey, in 1990. Uh, Funnily enough, uh, he was working at March, which was the company that supplied Williams with their very first chassis uh, back in 1977. So this kind of partnership between uh, Patrick Head and Adrian Newey helped to create the incredibly successful FW14B in 1982. The only thing that was the same on this car from the previous year in 1991 was the Renault engine. And the promising look of this car uh, was kind of what brought Mansell back to the team. And it was so dominating and such an an incredibly powerful car that Mansell easily won the Drivers' Championship that year. And they also won the, Williams won the Constructors' title that year as well. And as of 1992, Mansell won the most races of any driver in a single season up to that point. Now, the, the FW14B was kind of just the start of this uh, second golden era of Williams Racing, um, with the FW15C in 1983 closely following. These two cars are the most technologically sophisticated F1 cars to exist even to this point in 2023. That's because it included active suspension, which I talked about previously, launch control, which is the electronics that help to make the car accelerate fast and smooth, while also preventing any kind of slipping or engine failure or gearbox problems, which you would want to avoid. It basically helps make the the launch from the start uh, quick and easy. It also included traction control, which is individual wheel braking within throttle to maintain traction under acceleration. And power steering, which reduces the effort to turn the wheel. So think about if you've ever been in like a really old car, how difficult it is to turn the wheel. That is because that does not have power steering, whereas modern day cars do. It also had a semi-automatic gearbox. Uh, Automatic uh, transmissions are not allowed in F1 anymore, but this one was a semi-automatic, which means it could kind of go between manual and fully automatic at any point in time. It also had onboard telemetry, which is kind of the beginning of what we now uh, hear all about all the time of telemetry from the drivers and the engineering staff. It also introduced the fly-by-wire controls, which is where instead of having manual controls, it used uh, wires with electronic signals. And I know this is a lot of technological advances. There's even more. Uh, ABS, which is the anti-lock braking system. You'll often hear drivers nowadays talking about, oh, you know, locking up on the turn or coming in. I think Carlos just had a big lockup coming into the pit lane at the last race in Miami. So ABS, we have it on modern day cars. It basically just prevents that from happening in the first place. And they even had a push to pass button, which... In terms of F1, at this point in time, it was dealing with the active suspension and it lowered the rear of the car and helps to eliminate drag from the diffuser to help increase the speed by decreasing the downforce. Uh, Funnily enough, IndyCar actually has something currently called push to pass, uh, which is the same concept of you push the button uh, to kind of activate passing mode. But for them, for IndyCar, it just temporarily increases the horsepower of the engine. 
And now these, all of these features that I mentioned are, were incredibly groundbreaking at the time in the 90s, and you'll probably recognize some of them as features that are often found currently in modern day cars as just the standard. So it kind of helps prove that you know F1 really is used by manufacturers to help kind of validate and see kind of how a lot of features that you find in automotive cars uh, you know, can be transferred to road cars. Williams dominated again in 1993 with a uh, new driver to the team, Prost, winning his fourth and final World Drivers' Championship and Williams getting their second consecutive World Constructors' Championship. Uh, the second driver, Damon Hill, also got third with Senna splitting the Williams in the championship lineup. This domination of the past two years led to all of the electronic driver's aids uh, that I just mentioned to be banned for the 1994 season and onward. So it was kind of the last of these incredibly technologically advanced car and why these cars are still some of the most technologically sophisticated cars that uh, we'll see in F1. As um, Casey said, they banned a lot of the stuff she talked about for the 1994 season, which likely is why they didn't, I wouldn't say they had a bad season, but they didn't have a great season. And that is due to a multitude of factors. But for example, because they had to replace Prost due to his retirement the year before, they replaced him with Senna, which is interesting. But because of that retirement, actually, it was made so they were giving the racing numbers instead of giving the racing number one because pre-2014 basically all the drivers were given numbers one through 20 depending every year depending on where they finished in the driver standing so if you finished first you got number one for example and so forth and because there was no defending championship champion actively racing Williams was actually given the number zero instead. And they gave that number to Hill with Senna, who newly joined the team, keeping his number two as he finished second the previous year. But then due to Senna's death at San Marino, there were a whole host of other problems or quirks rather. For example, the Italian courts tried to charge the team and Frank Williams with manslaughter because he died racing for them and that matter actually only got resolved in 2005 which is insane considering it happened 11 years prior furthermore senna's death also meant that in monaco the race right after um, hill was the only williams car racing out of respect for senna as well as every um, race until from Monaco 1994 to the start of the 2022 season would have a S on their cars as a mark of respect to Senna when in 2022, the CEO decided it was time to move on. But as I mentioned, they needed another second driver. So David Coulthard, who we might know as a Sky Sports presenter now, actually drove for them in Spain and until after Portugal, when Mansell, who had left sport and joined kart racing, rejoined them for the last three races. But even though with all this driver chaos, they were able to secure the Constructors' Championship. In 1996, we once again saw them dominating after Schumacher actually dominated 1995, causing them to win the Constructors' Championship as well as Drivers' Championship with Hill. 1997, we once again saw a WDC winner with Villeneuve and the runner-up also being a Williams car with Heinz Harald Frensen meant they easily bagged the Constructors' Championship as well. 1997 kind of marked the end of the great era of Williams, as between 1991 and 1997, their technical director head with Nui Cambo 
uh, created cars that dominated only like what we've seen when um, Schumacher was at Ferrari and the Lewis Mercedes domination eras that followed that. During this time period of 91 to 97, Williams had 59 race wins, which out of the total 114 races in that time period means that Williams won 52% of all races that happened. During this time, they also won five World Constructors Championships and four World Drivers Championships, each with four different drivers, being Mansell, Prost, Hill, and Villeneuve. So Adrian Newey actually left the team after 1996, which kind of started the beginning of the end for these golden years with Williams. Very much so. I mean, 1998 and onwards basically saw, also saw a whole host of issues because Renault, their engine supplier, left the sport. So they bounced from one engine suppliers to the next, trying to find a reliable engine and stuff like that. So they bounced from, like, they had BMW for a few years. They had other engines, but they really, truly struggled to get back to the golden years. And because of that, we these days kind of know them as a backmarker team, I would say. Okay. Listeners, I will not lie to you. I have had no clue what's been going on this entire time. I've been reading what our girl Rachel has done because she did a lot of this research and we appreciate her, but she was not able to make it to tonight's recording. So I was a COVID girly who got into it through Drive Survive and Lauren Asher's books. Um, Drive Survive, here's what I know about Williams. My actual take on this is that Claire Williams, who is Sir Williams' daughter, she took over the team and ran it as team principal from 2013 to 2020. We love a girl boss, okay? She's only the second woman who has been a team principal in F1, and we stand that. We also stand a girl boss who knows when she goes a little too close to the sun, and she had said the whole time that she was on there and in Drive Survive multiple times, I am here to do what's best for the team. And if at any point it is not best for the team for me to be leading it, I am totally okay with it. And she will hand over the reins. So we love that she knows I'm going to try to do it and, you know, make my family legacy be great. But also I want the family legacy to still be a legacy in standing after I'm done. So if at any point I need to step aside and let somebody else try to take it further than what I can, totally okay with it. Uh, So shout out to Claire. And then during her time, uh, she took on a lot of rookies at Williams. They knew they needed that hot new talent. So in 2013, Botas was their rookie before he went on to drive with Lewis at Mercedes. Lance Stroll started in 2017 with Williams before he went on to Racing Point, which is now Aston Martin. In 2019, we love the crop of rookies that came from 2019. George started with Williams, and he was there for a while before he was able to get points. He finally got points in 2021 when he was at the Belgian Grand Prix. With his years at Williams, George became known as Mr. Saturday before he got stolen by Mercedes. Well, as we all saw on Drive to Survive, it seems like Bottas and George had uh, you know, quite the competition for that second seat at Mercedes, but they actually uh, had very similar career paths in that they both started off at Williams before uh, becoming Lewis Hamilton's teammate. And Williams, it now seems, is uh, kind of become the, the home of the rookies in F1. You know, in addition to the rookies that Dre mentioned, you know, also Sirius Rukin, Latifi, and now Logan, and there have definitely been more in the past as well. Yeah, and while Williams had a lot of ups and downs, one thing to note is that the Williams family did step aside in 2020 and is currently owned by the Doralton Capital, and their new era has began from there. We did want to touch on some Williams facts of now, and just some things to know is the current team standings are Alex Albon and Logan Sargent, and the Williams office is based in Grove, United Kingdom. The current team principal is James Fowles, pretty decent so far. They drive with the passion of Sir Frank Williams still to the state, and Williams is known as a rival by many. The Williams team still shows promise for the 2023 season so far with eight points. Looking forward to what the Williams team 
brings to the end of the season. And just one quick note is last year they did end the season in 10th place as the final final standings. So hopefully me would love to see more a little higher up than 10th place. We're going to talk about some more current Williams goodies, a.k.a. Miami Grand Prix. Spicy little extra episode coming to you at some point by myself, Chelsea, and Megan. And our moment of the week is going to be explained in that future little episode because our lovely Megan may have created a jewelry item for Alex and a few of the other drivers that were passed along to be given to them. So tune in for that episode. That wraps up our William Spotlight episode today. As always, keep up with us on socials. Paddock Girls Podcast on everything except Twitter. She's a little special. She gets Paddock Girls Pod. And just a little reminder, if you haven't already checked out our socials, you will see all the fun things on TikTok and Instagram. If you missed out on any of our Miami Grand Prix videos, do check it out. Share them, repost them, do all that fun shit. Thanks for joining us in the paddock. See you at the next race. Bye, Craig. I'm done with you today. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. See you, Craig. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig.